Thank you for the introduction, Ray. Um, my name is Matilda Anderson. I'm Head of Insight and Innovation at CrowdDNA, a culture insight and innovation agency based in London. I've been here for about a year and a half, and before that, I worked in audience research and planning at the BBC. So lots of experience in understanding visual culture and how to understand it, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about here today. So I'm going to go straight ahead and start my presentation. Humans have obviously been creating images since the dawn of time, yet in the last 12 months, more images were produced than all previous images combined so far. And I think that's why it's so important to, to really start uh, thinking about how we can understand this new type of, of visual culture that is emerging. This exponential explosion of images coupled with our offline lives and online personas increasingly blurry means a whole set of new challenges for market research. Few brands that we work with now doubt the importance of visual content, but our visual culture is changing so fast. In the age of the internet, crowdsourced aesthetic proliferate. So instead of professional content, visual trends originating on social media platforms go on to have huge influence. Recent research from Nielsen shows that content produced by non-professionals create more consumer trust for brands, in keeping with the low trust in traditional advertising that we can see as well. So brands now must keep up with the tastes of the digital crowd. The type of images produced uh, for new pla platforms are made by amateurs and bear all the hallmarks of the untrained eye. Heavily saturated colours, overexposure, lens flare and even pixelation. In the hands of the people, technologies are being used to produce images in ways they were not designed for, with unexpected glitchy results. We are, in fact, beginning to see ourselves through the eyes of our new technologies. I'm talking about seeing. 40% of the most frequent gamers say they will be likely to purchase their own VR headset within the next year. Showing VR is finally here for us to enjoy. But it's not just about people wearing headsets. These blurring boundaries between our online and offline worlds are even influenced how we communicate. Technologies believed to be rewiring our brains and changing the way we process, navigate and think about the world. Attention spans have been significantly reduced, while our ability to multitask has risen. Research has shown that 84% of Gen Zs regularly use various screens simultaneously as they watch online videos, send texts, and use social media platforms, which probably won't be that surprising to any of you. But what all of this means, and that's the important thing, is that we've established new and agile ways of communicating. So research conducted by the MIT has found that the human brain can process an image in as little as 13 milliseconds. And if an image can speak a thousand words, and the consumption of that information itself is faster, it's no wonder we're growing even more visually minded. Images, videos, emojis and acronyms are becoming the cornerstone of language, allowing rapid fire exchange between the world and ourselves. And of course, selfie culture now dictates personal interaction more and more. GIFs are also globally spreading language as an even faster way of communicating emotional reactions. Sites like Giphy provides vast libraries of looping animated images. And dating app Tinder has introduced a Giphy search feature that allows people to select and send GIFs in place of verbal communication with their matches. As ever multiplying terabytes of information are adding complexity to visual culture, we need to use new methods and analysis to help our clients stay at the forefront of culture and trends. So, increasingly, um, what this culture shifts mean is that we're using consumers' own favorite sharing platforms to understand their world. Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, and WhatsApp are just some of the platforms we've been using at Crowd in the last 12 months. 
And we're always trying new ways of talking to participants where they are, rather than forcing them onto research platforms that are unfamiliar to them. Unless, of course, there's really good reason for their use, um, depending on our client's business and research objectives. Sometimes an online community is what you need. and But of course, you can gather lots of the images from an online community as well. Images are great for reaching deep insights because they allow people to articulate thoughts, feelings, and attitudes more easily than if they're asked verbally. Responses are often more honest and real about everything from the day in the life of a toddler to what the future holds for our most loved entertainment personalities. Other advantages are that we get in the moment undisturbed private thoughts through a constant flow of messages where participants can share and respond as if they're just having a conversation with their friends or family. We ask people to share their own photos and we recently did research into millennial travel passions and received over 3,000 holiday pictures. Or we set participants up to do a photo task, send them away on a little miss mission. Um, but we also ask participants to immerse us in their visual world by sending us images that are already out there, showing us their aspirational outfits, favorite music videos, their idle home interior, or other visual cues to understand their world. For example, for Converse, we use Pinterest to explore visual identities and inspiration for sneakers among 16 to 24 year olds across six European markets. Prints and pastels, skate parks, Beyonce, bloggers, selfies and teddy boy imitations, we saw it all. And what we received back from the participants was a visually rich understanding of their styles. Clothes and shoes were key to driving their personal expression and visual identity which led to a breadth of outfits. One of my particular favorites is the, the leopard print inspiration in the bottom left. So five prominent style groups emerged, some driven by enduring an iconic culture reference point, so more slow fashion, and others by street culture, celebrities, and temporary trends, so more fast fashion. The insights were used to generate comms per market that spoke to the 16 to 24 Converse consumer in a way that resonated with them and dialed up the edge. Uh, in a global, for, global project for Viacom International, uh, we were understanding the often forgotten Generation X, once known as the slacker generation, but now no more, according to our research. So rather than asking Generation X all over the world what family means to them, what home means, what work means. We ask them to send us images that represent these areas of their lives. So these are images from our participants in Thailand. So you can see quite aspirational images of Thai design and art, but also national symbols of what Thailand means as a home. Quite different from our UK sample that were sending images of cups of tea and quite proud images of home cooking. But of course, um, images are not replacing other qualitative methods. They're just adding to them. We tend to encourage our clients to use visual methodologies in combination with others. So like online diaries, depth interviews, in-home ethnos, anything to provide context and alternative hypotheses to explore. And so how do we make sense of all these images? Sometimes up to 3,000 for one project. Well, it's important to have a framework for the analysis process. It provides a clear and relatively consistent way of analyzing visual data. And because visual analysis can sometimes be an abstract concept for our clients, it provides structure to conceptualize and to help them see the business value. Our framework takes a three-step process. So first, we describe the symbolism and the theme of the image. Secondly, we consider the social identities of the maker, the subject, and the owner of the image. And finally, we map the context of the image. I'll give you an example of a recent project. So we looked at masculinity and uh, coded different themes that we saw coming out. So in terms of masculinity, we looked at residual codes, which mean it's the image is communicating concept that's been around for a while. So in other words, it's been done to death. 
And in the context of masculinity, it's the demise of the lad culture that is residual. Dominant means a mainstream message or idea, something that's pretty widespread, and usually one that most players in the category are using. So, for example, normalizing metrosexuality is dominant within uh, masculinity and advertising masculinity, although some might argue that actually metrosexuality is becoming residual as well. Uh, emergent codes uh, are up and coming meanings and expressions. So in the context of masculinity, uh, celebrating the myriad of interests and appearances and characteristics of the modern man, as for example can be seen in um, the recent Lynx advert, Find Your Magic. The way people communicate with visual language often reflects wider cultural shifts in society. Many trends that make it into the mainstream appear online first, and so understanding the flow of influence as well as where and when new trends and culture shifts are emerging can be incredibly important for brands wanting to stay ahead of the curve. Take the, as an example the health goth trend, now firmly placed in the mainstream thanks to the Kardashians and reported as one of the most Googled fashion trends in 2014. It started as an internet subculture. Staying um, ahead of visual culture and, and understanding it can help establish whether brands are developing culturally relevant brand strategies that communicate to consumers in a meaningful way. So what will become of visual communication as we move into the future? Our prediction is that it won't take long for images and videos as we know them to become a thing of the past, as 360 degree cameras move on to the fore. Before long, we can expect to, to consider the meaning of visuals alongside the use of other senses, like touch, sound, smell and taste, as the use of augmented reality and virtual reality reaches the mainstream. In terms of research, VR is already developing into a research tool and one that we've been uh, experimenting with here at Crowd. Uh, and it will allow us to study much more accurately how people behave in certain situations. Asking people to react to stimulus they're actually surrounded by, or getting them to walk through their customer journey in reality, rather than casting their minds back, will hugely improve the, the reliability of our insights. With the pace at which technology progresses, things are changing at lightning speed. New forms of research technology um, is getting even better, but not only this, they're enabling unique and exceptional ways to tell stories and present insights, which is equally important. Um, we're committed to making sure we're at the cutting edge of developments in all things visual in the future as well. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>